Right, well, the next part of the book of Genesis that I want to give an overview of is chapters 3 through to chapter 11. Um, now, what's the basic uh, uh, point of these chapters? Um, these chapters answer the question, well, granted that God created a good ordered world and he created human beings male and female in his image, granted that God blessed animals, human beings. Well then, how come the world is in such a mess? People suck. People have stuffed it up, is the answer. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, it, it's there right at the beginning it's not as if people muck it up every now and then, and it's basically still a right, but fundamentally, right at the beginning, the first parents uh, that we had, uh, our ancestors, disrupted God's order. And uh, their descendants not only went along with it, but then as time went on, the disorder increased. That's number one. Secondly, the second issue is Okay, granted that, granted the fact that human beings have defied God's order, granted that human beings don't treat sex the way God wants it to be treated, well then, um, can human beings destroy God's good order? And does God withdraw his blessing from the world because human beings have stuffed it up? Um, yes, Sense, well, he's, he some of his blessing, but we, as you said yesterday, we still have children. Okay, so his blessing still operates in a fallen world, but in a way that's different um, to what we would expect. Okay, now let's have a look at this story. Um, now, uh, the, uh, we, we, you know, you, you, you know enough Christian teaching to, to know that the basic, one of the basic Christian teaching is about original sin. That's the original, you know, the basic sin, the fundamental sin. Now the original sin um, has consequences. It's like a, a, tide, a tidal wave um, with a number of different waves that affects everything. Let me give you the big picture. The trouble started within the relationship between human beings and God. Human beings were not happy to be in the image of God. They wanted to be their own gods. The break comes there. And it didn't stop there. It's not as if then, okay, they were unaffected. But the next dimension comes when uh, trouble comes from relationship with God to relationship within the family. Within the family of Adam and Eve, Cain kills his brother Abel. Family is disrupted. It's not only the relationship with God's disrupted and that then leads to two further disruptions um, uh, because human beings no longer um, care for the world as God does then animals get out of hand as well as human beings getting out of hand human beings kill human beings and violate human beings this continues this goes from family into the whole of society Murder, violence, anarchy. And animals threaten human life. Animals are supposed to be ruled by human beings, kept in place, destroy human life. And worst of all, you get, and it's a very strange little episode there because it touches on something which uh, uh, the Old Testament doesn't like talking about because it's so terrible and doesn't want people to speculate about. It's taboo stuff. Um, the less said about it, the better, because it's so dark. What happens is the sons of God take the daughters of men and father monsters. The sons of God are fallen angels. So the barrier between human beings and angels is broken. Um, uh, the order the spiritual order is disrupted. So all orders are disrupted. The religious order, spiritual order, 
the family order, the social order, sexual order. Instead of proper sex, you have rape in marriage or rape, violation, sexual abuse. Um, the uh, biological order is disrupted, and then the spiritual order is disrupted. Yes. Probably too much of a big question, but I didn't think angels could um, reproduce. I thought I was getting married. Can you can you sign it up in like? I can only tell you what's there. What it says. I've never heard about angels. Is that that's in here too? Okay, I'll come to it. I'll come to it. Yes, yes. Yes, you should read it a bit more closely. There's lots of unexpected stuff. Now, uh, let's go. Yeah, yes, Fred. Uh, Dylan? I'm oh, not Dylan. Gareth. 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 Yeah, not Gareth. 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 Yes. Yes. Gareth. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Handsome Gareth. Gorgeous. Gorgeous Gareth. That's what I want. Gorgeous Gareth. Gorgeous Gareth. Let's find out yes. tomorrow. Um, with the animal connection, the human connection, why is there a break there? Because I'll come to it. Come to this it. is big picture stuff. Let's just go through it. Um, now, uh, it's a pattern of sin and blessing that runs through it. Now, I'll give big picture stuff and focus on some of the issues that you've touched and then open for final discussion. Okay? It begins, the problem begins when with the temptation of Eve, doubt. Uh, the state comes and gets her to doubt, to mistrust God and God's goodness and implies that God is holding back something good from Adam and Eve because up to that point they have the knowledge only of good. If they are going to know everything they need to know, evil as well. If they're going to enjoy life, they need to know not only the good things, but they need to know the bad things. Mistrust God. And the temptation is... Uh, to eat the fruit. Why? Because then you'll be like God. What's the con? They are already in the image of God. Yeah. And he says, okay, you won't be just in the image of God, but you will be divine. You'll be your own gods. And you will know everything. You'll have power over everything. That's the temptation. Um, uh, so... The temptation is to rebel against God, to disobey God, to defy God, uh, and to deify themselves, which is a con. Uh, the result of that is God's judgment on Adam and Eve. And the judgment is very strange because uh, remember that God had warned them right at the beginning, if they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of tree and evil, they would die. 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 But God's judgment, now here's very important, God judges not to destroy but always to save. And God does something strange. He doesn't kill them off at that moment, but he expels them from the garden. He expels them from the garden, um, uh, covers them with clothes, I'll come to that, and eventually they die, but they don't die straight away. Now, what's so good about God expelling them from the garden? This is a merciful judgment of God. Um, there was still a chance for them to restore the, the relationship. There's a possibility for restored, but there's another even more practical reason. Notice that there are true two trees in the garden. They've eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If after that they eat from the tree of life, then what? They're immortal. They're immortal, but they're still sinners. Still sinners. And then sin becomes eternal. Can you imagine if in a sinful world, abusive relationship, if you had to suffer that eternally, that would be hell. So God's death in itself is merciful, right? Um, uh, so, for example, if a... Uh, girl has a sexually abusive father who, who's abused her, um, very hot, very rarely fixed up, the death of her father is a, a merciful thing because it draws the line. And there's no further, he can't do any further damage to her. 
uh, than what's already been done. But just imagine if both of them would be eternal then. Now, that's just a little area of the whole problem. So God mercifully expels them from the garden um, and uh, al no, allows them to die, but eventually he gives them a long, he still gives them life here on earth. Um, and then thirdly, God does something uh, to continue to bless them and to protect them. What was the problem? When they sinned, they realized they were naked and they were ashamed of themselves. Nakedness, shame, makes relationships possible, impossible. Just imagine if somebody could read every thought, every... What's going on in your heart? A relationship would be impossible. Okay? So the, our instinctive thing, as soon as we sin, is to cover up so that we can present ourselves in the best light to other human beings. Uh, Adam and Eve made uh, clothes out of leaves, not fig, it could be fig leaves, any leaves, rather inadequate clothes that aren't very good. So what does God do? He, he kills animals and he gives them permanent clothes. God clothes them so that life between Adam and Eve in marriage is possible. We can't have naked, in the spiritual sense, naked intimacy in marriage. We have mediated intimacy. And that's the only way marriage and sex can work. Clothes, we all wear clothes of some kind. And uh, that, that indicates something far deeper about shame and guilt. But then, paradoxically, even though Adam and Eve sinned against God and were kicked outside the garden, that blessed place, they still reproduce, they have children. God's blessing continues. So the blessing continues. That's the first cycle. Now notice you have a pattern here of sin, judgment, preservation and blessing. Now this is what's going to continue as we go on. Um, the break occurs here. And then the break occurs here within the family. Um, and it begins when Cain envies his brother Abel. And uh, the fact that God seems to favour Cain rather than... Uh, no, Cain okay, favour Abel rather than him. He's jealous and so what does he do? He kills his brother. Yes? This is... They've just, they've just come out of the Garden of Eden. They still kind of be innocent, maybe? No, there's no innocence after the fall. I mean, so he knows that he's going to, if he gets this big rock, because no one's killed someone yet. Mm -hmm. So if he, how does he know that he's got this big rock and smacking his head? Hey, you don't have to be taught evil. Look, if somebody, if particularly, one of the funniest things is that uh, the people, the, the people we're closest to and love the most are also the people who can hurt us most, and we hate most. And when you're hatred, you don't think. When you, the fuller your hatred, the greater the anger, the greater the violence. Um, you just do things. So, so he wouldn't have. It'd be, he would have hurt himself, so he'd know that hitting yourself on something would hurt. So as soon as he hit his brother... Okay, speculation. The story's not interested in those. You can, you, can, you can speculate till the cows come home. What happens is that he kills his brother and immediately feels guilty because then he buries his brother in the soil and then acts as if nothing's happened. Does he do? Yep, in the soil. Um, covers it up. Um, now... Then God confronts him and uh, says, where is your brother Abel? And he says the memorable line, am I my brother's, brother's keeper? And God should have said, but he doesn't. He said, yes, you are your brother's keeper. And that's the problem. Um, um, that he ceases to be his brother's keeper, kills him. Now, what's God's judgment on him? Since the blood of Abel has fallen on the soil, since He's buried Abel, he's covered it with... Now, uh, 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 Abel is estranged from the soil. There's the, the break between the soil, remember, and Adam is broken. <coughs> and he becomes dislocated. He's no longer at home ecologically, to put it in modern terms. And so he builds a city. 
and starts off a city culture. God banishes him from the soil. But then God does something strange. God puts his mark on Cain. A mark on Cain. Um, and that mark is God's mark. Everybody who sees that mark knows that Cain comes under God's protection. If anyone tries to punish Cain for his murder, they reckon with God. What's funny? What should God have done? Uh, Killed him. You killed someone, I kill you. I kill you. That's and that's what, that's what Cain's worried about, is that people are going to go out to kill him, and if they can't kill him, they'll kill his children or his grandchildren. There's going to be retribution. God protects the murderer. Covers him. By the way, um, the same thing happens in the New Testament. We killed our brother, who? Christ. Christ. And what do we get in return? Blessing. The mark of the cross on the forehead, the breast, in baptism. Blessing instead. God's protection. Strange stuff, yes? So, just, so a couple of things here too, like there's sin, God's judgment, preservation, and blessing. But yeah. in each case, before the sin happens, God warns. God warns. It's he always... warns Cain. He warns Cain. He warns Cain. He warns Adam and Eve and says, look, there's two trees, don't eat. Um, and that's one of the things that God's judgment never comes without warning. Look, there's lots of other things here that I can't touch on. That's the second side. Oh, then God blesses. The strange thing is that God blesses. He doesn't just continue to bless Adam and Eve so that they have additional children, but he blesses, guess who? Cain the murderer. He has children. And uh, you have the whole beginning of human culture, city culture, city life, urban culture, music, metalwork, and everything else that comes out of that. Then comes the third cycle. Um, things get completely out of hand on a cosmic scale. Um, David, I think it's your turn next. Can you turn to chapter 6? Let's read from... Uh, 1 through to verse uh, 12 of chapter 6. When men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My No, just stop there. Uh, married is um, uh, definitely not the word there. The Hebrew word is took. Took. They took the daughters of men. Um, now, sons of God, if you do a, a search elsewhere, this has a number of different senses, but its most obvious sense is angels. In this case, it's not good angels, but fallen angels, demons. Um, and what you have here is what... Uh, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen a film called Rosemary's Baby. They get a DVD. It's a horrible film. It's a ghastly thing. I don't recommend it. But if you want to... Hmm? Dodgy or... Um, no, because it's uh, um, uh, occult. It deals with occult matters. And the less you... In one one, I'm reluctant to recommend it because the less you know about the occult, the better. Um, uh, we run into occult things in our own, like in people's lives around us. Okay, and this is one aspect of it, and this is what would uh, uh, call uh, occult sex. Um, okay, and that's all I'm going to say. Uh, Let's keep going. Um, uh, my Verse spirit, 3, yes, then, then the Lord said. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with men forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. Right, so from this point, uh, uh, earlier on, human life had been much more open-ended. From this point onwards, the maximum human beings will live. God puts a limit, 120 years. Um, then he withdraws his spirit. Okay, yes. Keep going. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. When the sons of God went to the daughters of men, and had children by them, they were the heroes of old. Okay, the Nephilim okay, um, um, are giants or monsters, uh, freaks. 
Um, and they are freaks. No, it is, this is a very, very veiled expression. Um, uh, there's lots of things that are implied but not stated here. Um, the result of this union between demons and women sexually is the Nephilim. Um, the giants, the monsters, the freaks um, that have supernatural powers even though they are human beings. Keep going. Um, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil at the, at all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground, and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now go down to verse 11, to skip verse uh, uh, 9 and 10. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become. For all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. Now, just that last verse, there's two things I want to highlight. First of all, notice the earth was corrupt and full of violence. Very, it's interesting. I don't know if this rings a bell. The Hebrew word for violence is Hamas. Does that ring a bell? In Arabic, it is the same. Violence. Uh, Hamas. Now, violence is uh, violence rules. Violence at all levels. Violence, animals with animals, animals, human beings, men and women with each other, demons same and human... What? what? Sounds about the same now, except for the bottom one. Except for the bottom one, this one. Um, well... Okay, the occult is, and the occult is. not walking around there, you know, it's not like big monsters walking around there. You talk with certain people, no? But they might be physical monsters, but we've got. Could be spiritual. Yes, and there's increasing monsters in our society. Um, okay, uh, notice there's violence. The earth is corrupt. And violence. Now God has to do something because if violence continues, then what's going to the violence going to do? Destroy the earth. Destroy well, if not the earth, at least destroy life on earth. And God then acts to prevent violence from getting out of hand. And notice at all these different levels. The second thing, can you go to uh, verse 12? God saw how the earth had become, how corrupt the earth had become. For all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. Now, the word in Hebrew is not people, but all flesh had corrupted its ways. Now, flesh is the term not just for humans, but also for animals. Now, this is important for the Noah story, because uh, 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 the violence is not just human to human, physically, sexually, politically, socially, but also animals with animals and animals with human beings. Okay, what the story of the flood. What you have here is a breakdown of order in God's creation. So you have decreation. Creation has become decreated or disordered and the, uh, it's done so by violence and chaos on a cosmic scale. Cosmic scale means it's not just Earth, but it involves the spiritual realm. Yes? Well, that's not like chaos. It's, it's it, the danger is that if this goes back, then we're going to go all the way back to Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. The tohu va bohu, the chaos there. Um, now, God's judgment and it's a merciful judgment, is to clean out the mess with a flood. So it's to clean things up. And there's a flood to wash, to clean out the stables. So it's a cleansing flood, the judgment. And then God's act of preservation. You see, God doesn't want to destroy human beings. He doesn't want to destroy animals. He 
wants to save them. And so he saves a remnant of human beings, Noah and his family, and he saves a remnant of animals for a new start after the flood. Now, I'm finding that a bit annoying. Uh, it, just, sorry. Yeah, it, it, it might be good for you to concentrate, but I just can't yeah, uh, 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 not notice it. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, so you have then God's preservation telling Noah to build an ark, and notice it's not just for human beings, but animals. And then comes something remarkable. After the flood, God establishes a completely new order. He hasn't done away with sin, but he establishes an order in which he, uh, uh, as it were, uh, 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 hems in, lessens, controls the effects of sin. Now look at what happens here. Here you get the first covenant, and we need to look at this closely. But before we do, Levi, yes? Um, you said that the animals were corrupt as well. Yes. I was on the understanding it was our choice where um, we ate the apple and turned out yeah. that we, by doing that, we corrupt with the animals. That's right. So does that mean by Noah's righteousness the animals were... That's right. right. That's right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, because human beings are closely related to the animals, where human beings fail to fulfil God's mandate, which is they, they are to rule over the animals. Where they stop ruling over the animals, then the animals do what? They go out of control. Um, you get nature raw in tooth and claw. Um, and they, they don't just get out of control with each other, but worst of all, they get out of control over against human beings. Right? That's the result of the fall, is the order within the biological kingdom our is... Dis- is directly involved with... Like, yes, that. so our sin affects not only uh, the natural... It doesn't only affect the social realm or spiritual realm, it affects the natural realm. You know, if you like, in modern terms, it has ecological consequences. Um, now, let's look at this uh, remarkable passage. First of all, I think it's Josh. Can you read um, God's remarkable promise in chapter 8, 20 to 22? Noah does something. This is the first time this has ever happened in human history. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird. Offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now, okay, here we get the first altar that's ever built with the first burnt offerings on the altar. Uh, And burnt offerings are always for atonement for sin. So this is the beginning of sacrifice. Remember, we've had offerings with Cain and Abel, that's different, but now you get burnt offerings on an altar. Now, what does God do? Uh, Noah offers this sacrifice to atone for his sin and the sins of the whole world. Can you, what's God's response to it? Read. When the Lord smelled the pleasing odour, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind, for the inclination of the human heart is evil from you. Nor will I ever again destroy every, every living creature as I have done. Even though human beings don't change, God says, he will change. And he promises never to destroy the order, the earth, with a flood because of human sin. Keep going. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. Just notice that. One of the biggest issues for people of your generation is the threat of eco-catastrophe. And that has really panicked our society. In what sense? Like that the collapse of the ecological order, uh, global heating. Um, uh, in my generation, it was nuclear catastrophe. I still remember the most vivid day of my youth when I was at university was the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is ancient history for you. Uh, but what struck me that, do you know Cuban Missile Crisis? Where Khrushchev put missiles in Cuba and threatened uh, the US and President Kennedy put an ultimatum. he says remove those within the next 24 hours or the rockets will start firing. Uh, I heard that 
uh, in the morning, just before I went to university, none of the only people who attended lectures were Christians. You like the great end of the world. Everybody was sitting there waiting for the end of the world to happen. Well and happen. it could, and it was a hairbreadth. September, September, this is even more dramatic. Yes. September the 11th was local. This was the whole world. And my generation, if you're going to understand, has been living, was, you know, when your age, we're living under, and from our youth onwards, have been, we're living under the threat of nuclear catastrophe. Now, you are living under the threat of global warming. The new thing is eco-catastrophe, ecological test catastrophe. We'll be lucky in global warming and we cancelled out by nuclear winter. <laughs> That's one way of treating it, isn't it? Uh, but you have God's promise. What's God's promise? Human beings do stuff it up and it doesn't deny things happening, but what will God do? Continue to bless them. He will continue to uphold the order of nature. Despite all that human beings do. And that doesn't absolve human beings of responsibility. Now, and now God makes a covenant with Abraham. Now, covenant is a agreement, a legally binding agreement. And this is a one-sided covenant because God makes his commitment to Noah and all human beings after Noah and all animals. Notice animals are included in this covenant. Let's see what this covenant contains. Can you go on, please? Uh, Josh. First of all, verse. Uh, read from verse 9 through to verse 7. I mean, chapter 9, verse 1 to verse 7. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Pause button. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Who had God given that blessing first of all? Adam. Adam. And that was before the fall. Now God gives the blessing that he gave to the first Adam to the new Adam, Noah, after the fall. So he gives a blessing after the fall, a special blessing. Now, what does, what's involved in this blessing? Keep going. The fear and dread of you shall rest on every animal of the earth, and on every bird of the air, and on everything that creeps on the ground, and on all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing of this shall be food for you, and just as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Only you shall eat, you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. For your own lifeblood I will surely require a reckoning. From every animal I will require it, and from human beings, each one for the blood of another. I will require a reckoning for human life. Whoever sheds the blood of a human, by a human shall that person's blood be shed. For in his own image God made humankind. And you, be fruitful and multiply. Abound on the earth and multiply in it. So, what does God do about the problem of violence? Human beings, human beings, animals, human beings. He does something remarkable. Two things. He gives, allows human beings to eat the animals. Number one. He'd originally given plants to human beings. Now he gives animals to human beings. And in this way, um, uh, keeps the animal population under control and makes sure that the human beings uh, don't destroy animals because if they destroy all the animals then they will have no food. Right, so there's a vested interest either way um, but uh, number one human beings are allowed to eat animals. Number two God um, uh, permits limited capital punishment. What's the problems when violence gets out of control? Okay, I kill you, David. Okay, what does your family do? They don't just kill me, but they kill, or if they can't kill me, they kill one of my brothers or someone in my family, and preferably they kill two of it. And then what will my family do? Retribution. Some okay, you get see retribution and the chain of retribution always increases. It's crude, it never stops. So instead of one life for one life, and that's the end, you have an endless cycle of murder occurring, um, which never ends, and there's never a line drawn to it. Now, God allows 
human beings to kill one animal if that animal kills a human being. He allows human beings to kill one human being if a human being is killed. And then what? That's the end of the story. And in this way, it's fairly crude if you like, uh, he protects human beings and uh, uh, the sanctity of human life because all human beings, even after the fall, still are in the image of God and therefore they are under God's protection. Um, so, can you see? Um, there's giving animals to human beings as food and then sanctioning capital punishment. Notice sanctioning is not commanded, it's, it's limited capital punishment. That's the negative side of things, and then there's the positive side of things. Can you go on, please, Josh? Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the, in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Number one, a covenant is a legally binding agreement. And in this covenant, it's a one-sided legally binding agreement. God binds himself to this covenant. Secondly, God makes this covenant not just with Noah and his family, but all human beings and all animals. So its animals are included in this covenant. Thirdly, this covenant is an everlasting perpetual covenant. As long as human life continues here on earth, this covenant applies. So it applies until the end of the earth. Lastly, uh, God gives, oh not second last, God gives a sign. Uh, and it's interesting, it's not, just, it's not so much a sign uh, for us to remember God's commitment to this covenant, but for God to remember his commitment to the covenant. And that sign is the sign of the rainbow. It, that rainbow, every rainbow tells you of God's covenant. Lastly, um, uh, the content of the covenant is that God will not again send a flood to bring about an echo catastrophe. Uh, now, this promise is very relevant to people of our generation. Because what's the, what's the threat of global warming? Flooding. And we've had flooding before. Um, Although, although that, yeah. last time it was God doing the flooding, yeah. this time it will be us doing the flooding. Okay, but God will not allow this to happen. That's God's promise. He won't allow it to happen. Uh, okay, now, summary, we've got to go to chapel. Um, God's blessing is his covenant with Noah for the stability of the natural world and then the repetition of his, the mandate, the blessing and mandate to Adam. The blessing applies once again. Uh, very rich. But notice here, one last thing, that here we have the first altar and the first sacrifice for atonement of sin. So, this hints at, that God is going to deal with sin in a new way. He's not just going to curb sin, capital punishment, <coughs> promise of blessing, but he is going to deal with sin through atonement, sacrifice and atonement, the beginning of a new way of dealing with the consequences of sin. Now, next.